If you would, open with me to Acts chapter 6. Today is going to look a little different, maybe, than our typical time together on Sunday morning, uh, because we're going to uh, ordain some deacons in just a little while. And so I thought it would be helpful for us to at least look a little bit at Scripture and where we find at least some mandate uh, for the deacons and for what they are and where we get that from. And so Acts chapter 6, we're going to start there this morning. Uh, We will uh, kind of move over uh, and into uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 in a little while. And so if you want to uh, find Acts chapter 6 and then find 1 Timothy chapter 3 and then kind of put, I guess, a mark or your finger there or whatever to kind of keep your place, that would be wonderful. And uh, just know that uh, you do not have what we would typically have as a sermon notes page, but you do have a couple of places or pages in your bulletin. Uh, If you want to uh, take notes this morning, uh, you have some space to do that there. Uh, Let's just start by reading Scripture this morning in Acts 6, verse 1 through verse 7. It says, Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer And to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. And Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. It was a a new pastor who decided uh, to visit one of the children's Sunday school classes on Sunday morning. And uh, the teacher introduced him to her class and told the pastor that, Pastor, this morning we're studying the book of Joshua. He said, that's wonderful. And so he said, let's see what you're learning. And he asked him the question, who tore down the walls of Jericho? So a little boy named Johnny kind of shyly raised his hand, and he offered this. He said, Pastor, I didn't do it. (laughs) The pastor was kind of taken aback, and he said, come on now. He said, who tore down the wall of Jericho? And the teacher interrupted him and said, Pastor, little Johnny's a good boy. If he says he didn't do it, I believe he didn't do it. So flustered, the pastor went to uh, one of the Sunday school leaders and related the story to him. And that individual, looking a little worried, explained, well, sir, we've had some problems with Johnny before. Let me talk to him and see what we can do. He was really now bothered by the answers of the teacher and the director. And so the new pastor approached the deacons. And related the whole story, including the responses of the teacher and the director. And after a while of thinking, uh, one of the older deacons looked thoughtfully at the pastor. And he said, well, pastor, I just move we take the money from the general fund to pay for the walls and leave it at that. (laughs) I don't know what your idea of a deacon is. Maybe it has something to do with that. When little Johnny messes up the walls to uh, decide how we're going to fix them or what's to be done there. Maybe it's an idea of somebody who makes financial decisions. Uh, Admittedly, uh, you may have heard in Baptist churches churches, stories, of course, from other churches, of uh, nightmarish deacons meetings or those kinds of things, places where the deacons were responsible for bringing about strife in the church. Admittedly, as Baptists, we kind of... uh, have a stereotypical pattern for deacons that we kind of think of. Um, I would uh, at least say, thankfully, that here at Parkview, in this day, we do not have anything like that. Our deacons recognize and see themselves as servants. 
And what we see when we look at Acts chapter 6, while we don't see the office of deacon referenced, what we see is at least a pattern for what the office of deacon would become. So that by the time we get to 1 Timothy chapter 3, we, we have a, a clear picture not only of the qualifications for deacon, uh, but we have a clear picture at least we see of what they're doing and how they're functioning in the church. The office of deacon carries with it a tremendous responsibility. A responsibility to the Lord first and foremost, as we all do, but a responsibility to the church. And so we must be careful then when it comes to deacons that we're not just simply holding up a tradition as far as what we consider the office, but that we are looking to Scripture for what Scripture tells us about what deacons are and about the role that they play in the church. In Acts chapter 6, we we find some instruction about that. So this morning, uh, we want to look a little bit at the passage and, and consider elsewhere in Scripture what we find about this office and what it tells us. Uh, but then we want to consider together uh, a few different things. We want to consider the occasion of the establishment of the paradigm for this office, the purpose for which it was established, and then also the qualification that comes along with the office. When we take the word for deacon, we see it a hundred times in the New New Testament. Uh, It's translated in a few different ways, a service to serve or uh, in the verb serve. In the original meaning, it had the idea of serving tables, which we see in Acts chapter 6. We see that literally we could take the word to mean through the dust. It brings with it this whole idea of a servant, of one serving others. The only places where it's not generally used, meaning that it's used to signify an office or used kind of in a proper nounish type of way for the office of deacon are in 1 Timothy chapter 3 where we see the qualifications for deacons and in Philippians chapter 1 where Paul is greeting the Philippians and he says to the overseers and deacons. And so we see that picture in a few places. It's translated differently, Acts chapter 11, verse 29, it's translated as relief because the service was providing a certain thing to uh, the individuals, and in some places it's translated administration because of the context. In others, it's specifically centered around serving a meal. John chapter 2, in the wedding at Cana, Mary says to the servants or the diakonos, In Luke chapter 4, in the healing of Peter's mother-in-law, after she's healed, she rises and she serves them. Same word. Other places, it's uh, in serving a meal. John chapter 12, verse 2 is that way. Luke chapter 10, verse 40. Luke chapter 17, verse 8. But it also broadens, uh, not just to include the service to individuals in the sense that we're thinking in serving tables or serving a meal, it also broadens to include other types of service. In Romans chapter 13, verse 4, a soldier is called a diakonos or a servant, one who serves. And there's also places where it's used to designate a broad service of ministry that all believers give. So what everyone does is, uh, in that sense, uh, diakonos or, or serving the body. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5 speaks of a variety of gifts and manifestations of diakonia, which is that word for service, the way that we all serve in the church by our giftings and the things that the Lord has blessed us with. And even in Romans 12, it talks uh, specifically about varying gifts to the body. Specifically in verse 7, the words used are all the same word group that we take this word deacon from. And so the word being used in many places generally gives an idea of the role of deacon. They are a servant, and the office itself is taken from the word, meaning to serve. They are ones who serve in the church. In fact, uh, the word for the office uh, where we get deacon from is literally just a transliteration of the word from Greek into English. And so our English word deacon is from the Greek word for service. You say, well, Chris, what does all of that mean? Why the language lesson here today? It's because what we have to see in the midst of that is that if we're going to have this role in the church, it cannot be anything other 
than service to the body and service to the Lord. In fact, what we see is that some people are uniquely designed and uniquely gifted to serve. I think one of the best pictures that we could use to talk about uh, the, the picture of deacon service is the picture that we find in Jesus washing his disciples' feet, where each one, he takes the towel, he washes their feet. You see, if we look and see that serving was not above Jesus, then serving should not be above any of us. We are called to serve the body. And so what deacons, as the official, if you will, servants of the church, as the pattern for service in the church, set the pace for service, which is then extended to the entire church family. Last week, we looked at a picture of service and how we are going to, I guess, structure that. But what we should see is that our deacons are the lead servants in the church. They are the ones leading out in that. And so as we kind of examine Acts chapter 6 this morning, the first thing that I want you to see is the occasion of the establishment of this office. And while we might, again, not see particularly the office of deacon here, we see at least the seeds of that office in Acts chapter 6. And in fact, most would probably say that this is the beginnings of of the deacon office, even though several of these men that we look at who are named here go on to serve other functions beyond being deacons in the church. In fact, even Stephen, whose name there becomes a martyr for Christ, and because of his public proclamation and his faithfulness in proclaiming the gospel message, uh, we should not, I guess, not see the role of deacon present in these verses because it is very much the same as the calling that we see for a deacon today. So what's the occasion? Well, the occasion is a dispute. That, that might be shocking to you, that even in the early church, there were disputes in the church. In fact, not even just any kind of dispute, particularly a complaint. That might shock you that there would be complaints in the church. And of course, we say that tongue-in-cheek. We're all prone to complain about something at some point, right? But the particular complaint that arose were between the Hellenists and the Jews. Now you say, well, what's the difference in those? Well, a Hellenist was simply a Greek person and a Jew was a Hebrew person. And what particularly happened in this instance is that one of the groups was left out of something. In fact, it were the Greeks that were left out of what they called the daily distribution. So what we look at that and see is that it was a, an offering that was taken up to assist the widows. And their widows, the Greek widows, were, were left out of this. Now, it was not a malicious leaving out. This uh, distribution that was happening was a vital service of the church to those who were the most vulnerable and at need. If you were a widow in that day, you didn't have very much way of, of supporting yourself. And so the church came alongside of these widows to, to help support them. But it, no doubt, by virtue of what it was, was a very large service and uh, which required a great deal of logistics and time. And 12 apostles who were also seeking to spend enough time in prayer and enough time studying the word that they might bring it to the congregation, they were uh, taxed, if you will, to say the least. They were struggling to keep up. And so, so they at least fail in one part of it. Can I just be honest with you? That's awfully comforting to me. You say, well, why is that comforting to you? Because I know my own weaknesses, and I know that, that it is a struggle to make sure everything happens like it's supposed to. And even the apostles struggled at doing that. It's encouraging to me because what we see is that they didn't let it stop them. They came up with a solution. And so here the complaint arises from one group getting left out, and they bring that up to the church. And so what the apostles do is, is they say, okay, well, let's bring everybody together. Because what they realize is that, that there is a danger present here. And in fact, one pastor, as he describes it, said the church was faced with a dilemma. They had a choice that they could make. Either neglect the word and prayer in order to make sure everybody got what they needed, 
right? Or neglect the ministry to this group of individuals in order that the word might be adequately given, and that it might receive the primacy that was due to it. So what do you, what do you choose? Right? Which one would you choose? Thankfully, they didn't choose either. Do you realize that? Right? They didn't forsake one for the sake of the other. Instead, what they did was they said no, and they supported both, albeit in a way that was, I guess, novel for the moment. They said, as they brought everyone together, hey, we've got a solution to this. In verse 2, it says, the 12 summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now, again, that should not be taken to be demeaning in any way. It is not right, they said, that we should give up the word of God in order to make sure that this is done exactly like it needs to be done. He says, therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And the church, right, was, was all for it. It pleased the whole gathering. And so look at who they choose. And, and this might not be readily available to us. And in fact, it wasn't readily seen in mine. It was a commentary that revealed this to me. But every name of the individuals that they pick, they're all Greeks. They're all Greek people. And so what was their solution? So that the, the Hellenists would not be left out in this, so that the Greeks would not be left out, they picked Greek people to help with the distribution and to be able to do this. It was a spiritual determination that was incredibly practical in the way that they did it. Right? And so what was preserved were both things. Do you see that? They didn't neglect the word of God in prayer in order to make sure the ministry happened. No, instead they delegated that ministry out to those who they knew were trustworthy and could handle it. Why was it so important that they have these qualifications? It was just handing out a distribution, right? Well, it probably came with a very huge responsibility because it was probably a large sums of money that they were doling out and food that they were bringing and all of those kind of things that were part of it. It was an incredible support mechanism of the church, and they needed faithful men who could be trusted in that ministry, not only that they would be faithful to carry it out, but that they would be faithful in what was given. We know this is a challenge, and we look, can look back at other parts of the Scripture that we see, even with Ananias and Sapphira, and we can look and notice that, that there were challenges in the church. Not everybody was operating on the idea that, hey, we're just all about Jesus and all about advancing the church. They were about themselves as well. And so it was very important that they uh, looked and found those of good repute who were full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And those were the ones that they appointed to that duty. And so the complaint, based on the, the failure in that sense, then brought about this office. And it's incredible to look at the way that the apostles support them both. And so what we should see is the importance of the word and its role in the church. Right? That's a primary aspect of this passage. They realized that without prayer and without the word, they were not going to be the church that they were called to be. They were not going to be doing in the church what they were called to do. It was a primary function to bring the word of God to the people. But they also recognized that they could not and should not neglect the individuals in the church. And so what they did was they established the office of deacon. That was the purpose. Right? And so we move from the occasion to the purpose that everything might be fulfilled, that they were meaning to fulfill, that they might be faithful to the Lord, their purpose in establishing this office was to support the function of the ministry of the word and uphold the ministry to the body that the church is called to have. And not much changes from what we see it to be today. Not anything changes from the calling that's given to it today. I don't want you to miss something else in this passage. Don't miss that there are two significant places that we can look at as kind of brackets for the passage. In fact, in verse 1 and in verse 7, we see those brackets. Look at verse 1. It says, now in these days when the disciples were increasing in number. Right? Notice what Luke shows us. He shows us the advancement of the church. It's growing. 
And that's a neat thing. We see that several places in Acts. It talks about the growth of the church. We've seen that previous to these moments. Verse 1, in those days the disciples were increasing in number. And that creates part of the issue that they have and the challenge of it. They meet the challenge while keeping the word of God primary, keeping prayer as a part of their ministry. And then look at verse 7. And the word of God continued to increase. And the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. Don't miss verse 7. As the word of God increases among them, they increase in their growth. We should not miss that there is nothing better for God's people than God's word. Uh, We should not miss that, that the word of God is shown there. When we give primacy to God's word and structure ourselves in order to do that, then the Lord honors it because the one thing he's promised will not return void is his word, is the word of God. And so what we see here is as the apostles under that conviction and seeking to be faithful to the Lord, as they walk that direction, what we see is that it leads to growth. It leads to growth in the word, which in turn leads to a growth in their numbers. The Lord has promised his word will not return to him void. And the apostles believed that. And they functioned in that way. And so that's the occasion, right? That's the the purpose for the office of deacon. But in it, we also see those qualifications. And and we shouldn't miss that. It's not just an office saying, hey, anybody can serve, go ahead and serve as a deacon. No, it gives a qualification for them. Because as lead servants in the church, as those who are called to do that, we see that they're given some qualities or qualifications that they should have. In Acts 6, they are to be uh, of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom. And so there is a, a responsibility given that they would be believers, that they would trust the Lord, they would be faithful to him, that they would be desiring to serve him, desiring to, to grow and increase in the knowledge of the Lord. When we turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3, it kind of gives us in verse 8, through verse 11, a a bit of a fuller picture of these qualifications as Paul is writing to Timothy, who is uh, likely the pastor of the church at Ephesus. And he's encouraging Timothy in this ministry that Timothy has been given. In chapter 3, he first gives him the qualifications for overseers in verse 1 through verse 7. And those qualifications that we see for overseers would be the qualifications that we have for pastors or for uh, those who are Uh, the elders, if you will, in the church. And so the qualifications for overseer being seen in verse 1 through verse 7, he then moves to the qualifications for deacons in verse 8 through verse 13. This is what he says. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. They're one of those places where we see the office itself referenced, the qualifications are given. And again, let me list them for you one more time. Not double-tongued, addicted to much wine, greedy for dishonest gain, holding to the faith with a clear conscience, dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful, husband of one wife. That means that they are faithful to their spouse, or a better translation might be a one-woman man. Managing their children well and their households well. The bottom line just being, and we look at that charge blameless. Many people get tripped up on that. Does this mean that they have to be perfect? No, it means that there is no active charge that could be brought against them at that moment. Deacons are those who are called in this way. And in this picture of testing, they are called to be tested. They are lives to be looked at. And so uh, in a few moments, uh, Richard McClellan, who's our chairman of deacons, is going to come and, uh, and talk to you a little bit about that testing and a report from our ordination council. But 
It, it is that they are called to, to be tested, to be found, to be faithful in the faith, right, but also able to serve in that way and had that they have been serving in that way. And so these qualifications serve as the standard, if you will, for the lead servants in the church. Behind them, though, and this is what I hope you'll see in these qualifications, right, we, we should all endeavor to be this. Right? It, it's not that we look at these qualifications and what we see is that the qualifications for a pastor mirror at least the qualifications for a deacon, except in one particular way, and that's the ability to teach or being able to to teach, and a few other things are added to uh, the pastoral qualification there, but in the qualifications for deacons as well, we, we see a picture of what every one of us really are called to be. We see a picture of what we should all endeavor towards, and the faithfulness and obedience that we should all show to the Lord, and to our families, and to His church. That's the calling in the midst of this. And so prayerfully, that what you would have as a part of your life would be these things as well. That they would be seen in you. And so as we look at the office particularly, we are seeing that these are qualifications for a deacon particularly. But I don't want you to miss that, that they're really qualifications that we should all have as a part of our life. That should be recognized in all of us. That at any point that we find we are stumbling in an area or guilty in any of these things, we should run to repentance, knowing that the grace of the Lord is able to forgive us. And so as we think about this setting apart of these men in this role, this distinct role of service in the church that supports the ministry of the Word of God and the functions of the church, uh, we give a, a charge to these candidates. And so uh, particularly this morning, we have three candidates that we are bringing for deacon, uh, Jeremy Coco, Tom Spears, and Brandon Laborde. Uh, and this is the charge that we're giving to them this morning. With Scripture saying that those who serve well as deacons, and we find this in 1 Timothy 3 that we just looked at, gain for themselves a good standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus I would add that in themselves this is seen, but it also is a challenge to, to everyone else. It, it is a challenge to all of us as we see their life and their standing in the faith and the confidence that they have in Christ Jesus. It impacts the body. It impacts everyone. And, and brothers, I would hope that in this you would see that you're not called to an office, but you are called to a task. Now, that office bears a title, and it is an office, but more than anything, by virtue of everything we said, I hope that what you see in that is that more so than just an office, it is something that you are called to do and something you are called to be. You are a servant. And so that, that uh, function, it's found in the name of the office that we're ordaining you to today. And this body is serving as a witness to the reality that you're committing to the Lord before them, that you're committing to this task for the benefit of his church. And so what I would charge you to is charge you to be faithful to that task and to realize the enormous opportunity that you have to help advance the gospel and advance the church through what you do today. And may this serve as a reminder for all of those who bear the title of deacon who serve in that office, is that what you do in the church, and by extension, brothers and sisters, I hope that you would see that what every one of you do in service to the church helps to advance the gospel and advance the church. And that's the calling that we've been given. That's what we are supposed to do, and that's to serve. To serve the Lord, but as we serve the Lord, to recognize that what we are doing is we are serving one another. And so we've watched these men walk through this last year. They've shown themselves to be capable and faithful. And so don't allow the installation into the office to diminish your fervor for service. Don't allow the install installment into the office to diminish your desire to be faithful to the Lord in those ways. I think it's 
pretty neat that as we look, I mean, we can look across these, and we acknowledged this last week as we uh, had a time together with these men, what we call an ordination council, uh, just talking to them about it. Um, these guys understand service. Um, not only is it part of what they do in the church, it's part of what they do in their careers and in their professions. And so um, even just looking at, at how their determination uh, to be a witness in those things uh, is part of what they do. It, it was really neat to hear them talk about that. And so uh, as pastor of this church, I am thankful for the opportunity to do this this morning. And, and let me just add to this. Uh, some of you may have never witnessed a deacon ordination before. We typically do them on Sunday nights, uh, but we wanted to do this as a, as a whole body gathered together, and so that's why we moved it to Sunday morning today. And so uh, I, I, hope this, uh, I hope for this to be our practice, uh, I guess, uh, in the future and moving forward. Uh, and so let me just kind of uh, prepare you for what's going to go on in the next few moments. Uh, we're going to uh, sing uh, a hymn in just a few moments. Um, and the reason for that is to, uh, to challenge you in two ways. One, to challenge you to pray uh, and begin praying for those that are uh, coming for ordination. We're going to bring them up here in just a few moments. Um, but pray for them. Uh, pray for their service. Uh, pray for the challenges that they will face because it, it doesn't get any easier once this ordination happens for them to serve. It's still going to be a challenge. There's always going to be obstacles to being faithful, always going to be challenges that emerge. Uh, we want to pray that the Lord would help them to remain faithful. Also, you can pray just uh, as we think about this whole calling to service that every one of us are given. Uh, it should be that this being the lead office or, or lead serving office in the church should, should cause us all to ask the question and kind of begin to think about, hey, how am I serving in the church? What's my role? How am I going to help to advance the gospel and to advance the church through what I do? And let these few moments of uh, reflection and response uh, be an opportunity for, for you to ask yourself that question as a believer. And then also just take a few moments to thank the Lord. That in His wisdom, uh, in His grace, He has given us offices in the church. He, he has given us those in the church to help with the function of what it does. And, and I would just say this. Any of you who have been a part of a church for any amount of time, even if it's just been a week... You have been impacted in some way by the faithful service of deacons. You have definitely been impacted in this church by the faithful service of deacons. And if you grew up in another church, you have been impacted at some level by the faithful service of deacons. How will that spur you and motivate you to be even more faithful to the Lord? To seek to, obedi to be obedient to him in all things. And so uh, as we begin that time, let me pray for us. Um, our band and Michael and uh, some instruments are going to come and, and play. We're going to sing. Uh, and so this song that we sing is a, a commitment song, but we encourage you that if you'd like to, to just pray during this song, uh, that's fine. If you want to sing the words and let them be a proclamation of your heart, uh, that's fine. We also understand maybe uh, you have a need for prayer, so our pastors, as we are every week, will be here to pray with you. If that be your desire, you can use the steps here as an altar. Um, but in the cues that we have just given you, uh, this is a response to the Lord. And so like this, let's make this time about him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. God, as we look at, at your word today, uh, Father, what we are seeing is a picture of, Lord, the ways that you have uh, set those apart for service that might help and encourage the body of Christ. Uh, Father, as we look at, uh, Lord, that paradigm that we see in Acts 6, God, I thank you that in your wisdom, uh, Lord, you... Lord, I gave the apostles, Lord, that, that picture. And, Lord, they put it into practice. And, Father, now as we look at it, God, we see, uh, Lord, at least a paradigm for us to follow. Lord, I pray that you would challenge our heart, hearts individually today. Uh, God, as we, uh, Lord, move forward in this time to ordain these three men, God, I pray that it wouldn't just be about them, but it would be about us as well. That, God, it would be a challenge to our own service, God, our willingness to serve, uh, Father, our understanding of it. God, what we're willing to do in it. Uh, and Father, through that, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be more faithful and more obedient to you. And so, Lord, we offer you this time as a time of response of our hearts to you. God, we pray that you would work in our midst through it. It's in Jesus' name we pray.